Shalom Hadavar Nicks. Welcome to Hadavar Messianic Ministries and our School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We're studying the prophet Ezekiel and we're in the 2022 edition. Uh, our session today is session 35 and just session 35 begins in chapter 38 and verse 9. So let's, be go, ahead, let's go ahead and review where we were last session. Uh, last session, we were in the kingdom period in verses 15 through 28. And we learned that in the kingdom, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom would be reunited. The southern kingdom being Judah and his companions. This is Judah with Benjamin nestled on the top northern border, nestled up against him. And then Simeon. These would be the, the southern kingdom, Judah and his companions, reunited with Joseph and his companions, which would be the rest of the tribes of the northern kingdom. And this, this reunion would be indis indissoluble. It would be likened to two sticks being made into one. And so Ezekiel was told to take a stick. Here's a stick labeled Ephraim and a stick labeled Judah and put them together in his hand. And the end of one stick would butt up against the end of the other stick and the joint would be hidden by Ezekiel's hands. And so the illustration is two sticks becoming one, two nations becoming one. We were also told that Ezekiel's temple would be constructed, or I should say the millennial temple would be constructed in the Messianic kingdom. And here's a possible floor plan of Ezekiel's temple. And here is the millennial temple in an artist's rendering. Perhaps it might look like this. And consistent with Isaiah 4, 5, and 6, we were also told in Ezekiel that the glory would be over everything like a, like a canopy. And here's an illustration of the, of the Shekinah glory over Jerusalem and over the millennial Mount Zion like a canopy. It'll be beautiful. It'll be a great thing to see. Great, great view to see. Then we moved into chapter 38. And in chapter 38, we learned that the time frame we're in is after the first coming, but before the tribulation. In other words, we're in the church age. We're in the age that we're part of today, the modern era. So we may see this event happen in our lifetime. The, uh, the chapter 38 begins by telling us that Gog, who's the commander of a, of a military force, will come against Israel. Now, he's a Magogite. He's from Magog, and we don't know exactly where Magog is located. Some think it's between the Caspian and, um, Red, and the Black Seas, uh, which would be southern Russia, or some think it's in Turkey. And still other commentators feel that Magog uh, immigrated north up into the area of Kazakhstan, somewhere up in that, that area, but southern Russia. And he's also the commander of three other areas. The first area is called Rosh, and Rosh is the basis for the name Russia. Rosh and Russia, which is again to the north of Israel. Uh, he's also the commander of Meshech. We don't know where Meshech is. Most commentators put it in Turkey somewhere. Uh, some say that Meshech is the basis of the name Moscow, which is the capital of Rosh or Russia, Moskva. Meshech, Moskva. They do sound a little bit alike. Not everybody agrees with this, of course. And then finally, he's also the, the leader of Tubal, and Tubal is thought to be in Turkey somewhere. And Tubal is thought to be the basis for the name of the Russian Siberian capital, Tobolsk. Tobolsk was the Siberian capital at one time. Then we went to the Art School Tanakh series, and we learned in that commentary that the rabbis have a tradition that when you see the Russian navy passing through the Bosphorus on the way to the Dardanelles, put on your Sabbath clothes because get ready for the coming of the Messiah. And so that's quite an, interesting, um, quite an interesting tradition as well. Here's the Dardanelles. Uh, you pass through the Bosphorus, then the Dardanelles, and into the Aegean Sea. So here's our associations. Uh, four, so five, one, two, three, four. Four associations with uh, Russia. Uh, the fifth one, the Russian Navy. Now the, the um, the members of the military coalition are now listed. And the first one is Persia. Persia is modern Iran today. 
and then Kush, Kush is modern northern, northern Ethiopia today, Put is thought to be Somalia, or some put, uh, place it in Libya. Some think Gomer, Gomer is, is named next, and some think Gomer is a reference to Germany. It could be a reference to the Ukraine as well. And then um, Togarma is thought to be Armenia. And uh, all these nations are to come against Israel from the uttermost parts of the north. And of course, if you go due north from Israel, you um, run into southern Russia. And if you keep going beyond southern Russia, you uh, come uh, right up to Moscow. You run right dead smack into Moscow. If you keep going beyond Moscow, then uh, you come to the, the uh, Arctic Ocean up there. So Russia is the uttermost parts of the north from Israel. So Russia will gather her forces somewhere. Would it be southern Russia? Possibly. Um, how will they get into Israel? Through Syria? Possibly. We don't really know. All we know is that for sure this coalition has to come from the uttermost parts of the north and uh, enter Israel and attack Israel. So now we have five associations. Our additional association is Magog. Uh, this is, these are rabbinic associations. Our final and fifth rabbinic association is Magog, which could be Germany or the Ukraine. We also learn in chapter 38 that this coalition would come against the mountains of Israel, and the mountains of Israel are in the West Bank today. This is the Judean Hills. So that's where the battle will be fought, and where Gog will meet his end. All right, this brings us to the new material. We've looked at the place of the invasion, we looked at the object of the invasion, now we look at the massiveness of the Asian in the invasion, starting with verse 9. You, and he's speaking to Gog, you will go up, you will come like a storm, you will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many peoples with you. Now this statement, you shall go up, is not a reference to an air invasion, it's not a bunch of bombers and fighters flying over Israel. It's just a, a Jewish idiom for going to Jerusalem, because wherever you are, you have to ascend the Judean hills to get up to Jerusalem. So here's a little map. If you're in the Shvela and the uh, coastlands, you have to ascend the Judean, hill, Jude, the Judean hills. You have to go up to Jerusalem. If you're in the Negev, you have to climb the Judean hills up to Jerusalem. If you are in the Jordan Valley or in Galilee, same problem, you have to ascend the Judean hills to go up to Jerusalem. So we always say, the Bible always talks about going up to Jerusalem and going down from Jerusalem, going to and going from. So that's all that's being talked about here. Now a couple of similes reveal the massiveness of the invasion. You shall come like a storm, you shall be like a cloud, like a huge dark black storm cloud covering the land. And then those involved are mentioned, you, that's a reference to Gog, and then all your hordes, that's the nations who have, um, who, who, over whom he is a prince, uh, they were named in verses 5 and 6, and many peoples like you, this is the numerous allies, the unnamed members of the coalition, like this huge storm coming over the land. So let's summarize, let's summarize where we've been. Uh, first of all, the prophecy presupposes that Israel is back in the land. This prophecy could not be fulfilled before 1948 because there was no Jewish state before 1948. Simple as that. Secondly, this return is in unbelief, for Israel is saved only after this invasion. C, or third, this return in unbelief was already in, intimated in Ezekiel 36, 24, 27, and in the vision of the dry bones in 37, 1 through 14. So those chapters are the background to 38 and 39. Now the restoration and unbelief is described in four ways. Number one, it's a land brought back from the sword, and we Jews have gained the land by war. Unfortunately, it's been an un unending war. It's still going on. But the fact that we are brought back, uh, that we uh, possess the land from war, because of war, um, will not be true with the second worldwide regathering. It won't be regained, uh, we won't regain it by war, the Messiah will regain it for us. 
But as for today, the first worldwide regathering, we're still involved in that, that um, unending war. It began with the War of Independence in 1948, it continued with the Suez-Sinai Campaign, 1956, the Six-Day War in 1967, the War of Attrition in 67 through 70, then the IDF raid on the PLO in Beirut, 1973, the Om Kippur War of 1973, the Entebbe Rescue of 1976, the Operation Litani, 1978, the raid on the Iraqi nuclear reactor, Saddam Hussein was trying to prepare a nuclear material for a bomb, uh, the Operation Peace for Galilee, 1982 to 1985. The First Intifada, 1987 to 1993. That was a long guerrilla war. Operation Defense of Shield in 2002. The Al-Aqsa, or Second Intifada, 2000 to 2005. Another very long terrorist war. The Second Lebanon War in 2006. Operation Cast Lead in 2008 and 2009, Operation Pillar Defense in 2012, Operation Projected Protective Edge in 2014, Operation Guardian of the Walls 2021. You getting tired of all these wars? Yeah, I am too. Operation Breaking Dawn 2022, and finally in 2023, Operation Shield and Arrow. It's a land <coughs> gained by war. All right, here we go again. The restoration of unbelief is described in four ways. Number two, Israel is, is, in, is a land that is gathered out of many peoples, and the Jewish people are returned after 90 different nations, being dispersed in 90 different nations. Third, it's a land with mountains that have been a continual waste for two millennia, 2,000 years. They've been desolate and deserted. Four, it's a land brought forth out of the peoples, and this is, a, again, a reiteration of the nature of the worldwide regathering. So all of these statements are true of present-day Israel, and the waste places have been rebuilt and resettled. And you know, we have an eyewitness to this portion of history, and that eyewitness to history is none other than the American writer Mark Twain. Uh, he wrote a book called Innocence Abroad. Here's a quick book report about Innocence Abroad from Wikipedia. The Innocence Abroad, or The New Pilgrim's Progress, is a travel book by American author Mark Twain, published in 1869, which humorously chronicles what Twain called his great pleasure excursion on board the chartered vessel Quaker City through Europe and the Holy Land with a group of American travelers in 1867. It was the best selling of, of Twain's works during his lifetime and one of the best selling travel books of all time. And you can pick up a copy of Innocence Abroad if you're interested in doing so on Amazon. Now here is what Mark Twain wrote, just a, a couple little excerpts out of his time in Israel itself. He wrote, we traverse some miles of desolate country whose soil is rich, rich enough, but is given wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We reach Tabor safely. We never saw a human being on the whole route. In other words, the land was deserted. We pressed on toward the goal of our crusade, renowned Jerusalem. The further we went, the hotter the sun got, and the more rocky and bare, repulsive and dreary the landscape became. There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere, even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. No landscape exists that is more tiresome to the eye than that which bounds and approaches to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mournful, dreary, and lifeless. I would not desire to live there. It's a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. And indeed it, it did for 2,000 years, waiting for its, its owners to return. And here's some photograph evidence of exactly what 
what Mark Twain witnessed. These are colorized black and whites taken in uh, around in the late 1860s. There's Mount Tabor, desolate and deserted. And this is Mount Carmel, desolate and deserted. And Jerusalem, not deserted, but definitely desolate. But not today, not today. This is the Jezreel Valley today. Uh, it's definitely, it's filled with life and agriculture, fish ponds, and even got a military air base there. That's the Jezreel Valley today. This is Mount Tabor today. No longer deserted or desolate, is it? And Haifa, this is uh, Israel's thriving uh, port, seaport. It's not desolate or deserted at all. And, of course, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is much more interesting than it ever was in, in uh, Mark Twain's day. And the Judean hills, been replanted by the Jewish people, no longer desolate. There, the Judean hills are quite beautiful. And they're covered with terraces and uh, agriculture such as olive trees. There's the Judean hills today. And Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv wasn't even a city when Mark, Brantain, Mark Twain visited the land. It got founded in 1909, a number of years after he was there. And this is a very interesting little excerpt that I found in um, Israel, My Glory in, in 2009. Apparently it was published first in Harper's Magazine in 1898. The Incredible, The Inscrutable Enigma. And he wrote this article concerning the Jews. Here's what he wrote. If the statistics are right, the Jews constitute but 1% of the human race. It, suge it suggests a nebulous, dim puff of stardust of lost in the blaze of the Milky Way. Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of. But he is heard of, has always been heard of. He is as prominent on the planet as any other people and his commercial importance is extravagantly out of proportion to the smallness of his bulk. His contribution to the world's list of great names in literature, science, art, music, finance, medicine, and abstruse learning are also a way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all the ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. He could be vain of himself and be excused for it. The Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose and filled the planet with sound and splendor and then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, but they are gone. Other peoples have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? Well, Mr. Twain, I really regret that you couldn't answer that question because you grew up in a culture that was very positive to the Bible. The answer is right there in the Bible. And if you had studied it and read it carefully, you'd probably know the answer. The answer, the secret to our immortality is God because God made a, co a covenant with the Jewish people. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is an unconditional, eternal, and unilateral covenant. God has made with the Jewish people. It consists of three promises. The first promise is the land promise, the land of Israel. That promise is developed and fulfilled in the land covenant. Also an unconditional, eternal, and unilateral covenant. The second promise is the national promise. That's expanded and developed by the Davidic covenant. And then the third promise, the spiritual blessing promise, is expanded and developed by the new covenant. And all these covenants are unconditional, eternal, and unilateral. So that's the answer, Mr. Twain, to our immortality. God is a covenant-keeping God. God has a covenant with us. And so for, and therefore, God honors his covenants. And therefore, Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel, live. 
All right, let's move on now to the planning of the invasion in verse 10. Thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil plan. So this invasion is premeditated and carefully planned by Gog, whoever he is or whoever he will be. And this is a beautiful example of the interaction between God's sovereignty and free will. On the divine side, God's sovereignty, God says this will take place in the latter days. He has foreknowledge. He's not limited by time. He knows what goes on in the far future. He also says something, things like, I will turn you about. I will put hooks in your jaws. That speaks of his omnipotence. So God, in his sovereignty, can do anything that he wishes. Now, the human side of the coin, that's the divine side of the coin, you know, doing everything he wishes. But the human side of the coin is that men make free decisions, responsible decisions. Gog is planning and making a responsible decision. It is a premeditated and carefully planned invasion of Israel. Now, a lot of people have trouble with this, sovereignty and the free will of man. Well, let me explain it to you in simple terms that I can understand. I view it like a train track. Whoever invented the train figured out that he was going to have it run on two tracks and the tracks would be held in place by the ties. So that's the way the train works. That's the way that machine works. But God has his own machine, and uh, it's called his plan, and he has designed it to run on two tracks. One track is his sovereignty, the sovereignty of God. The other track is the free will of man. And um, they go on forever, and they work together. They work together, and a lot of people have trouble. How can God give up his sovereignty to man, or how can man in any way understand the sovereignty of God? Well, this is all hold together because this is God's design. This is the way he decided, I'm going to make my plan work. And so he holds it together. How does he do that? Colossians 1.17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together together. He's the ties. He's the wooden ties that ties the two rails together, keeps them parallel, and so God's train runs down God's track with no problem. Now the rabbis uh, attack the problem in this manner. In a Mishnah vote 316 they said, everything is foreseen, that's an acknowledgement of God's sovereignty, but the right of choice is granted, and that's the tip of the hat to free will. Uh, they simply accepted the paradox and chose to live with it and to, to, pro to uh, promote both sides of the equation. <clears throat> now, so because both work together, both work together to accomplish God's will. Now, the modern Western mind tends to hold ideas in opposition. This idea goes over here, this idea goes over there, and then never the, the twain shall meet and therefore they're two separate ideas. But ancient Near Eastern thinking tended to harmonize ideas, to bring them together, and to accept the paradox. And that's what, exactly what we see here in Mishnah 316, and that's exactly what I'm telling all of us to do her, here. Learn to accept the tension. Learn to accept the paradox. God's sovereignty and man's free will both work together to accomplish God's plan, God's plan for this world. All right, now let's take a look at the purpose for the invasion. We start in verse 11, and you will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will against, go against those who are at rest, that live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars and gates. So Gog, Gog thinks that he's in charge of this attack. I will go up in the land of unwalled villages. And he's going against an Israel that is experiencing security and confidence. So in verse 12, we learn the four reasons why he goes against uh, Israel. Verse 12, he goes against Israel to capture spoil and to seize plunder, to turn your hand against the west waste places which are now inhabited, and against the people who are gathered from the nations, who have acquired cattle and goods, who live at the center of the world. So here's the reasons, he, the purpose for the invasion. First of all, to take the spoil. This refers to the spoils of war, economic gain. Secondly, to take the prey. 
That means to plunder through military victory. He wants to gain national prestige, prestige, territory. Thirdly, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited. He wants to destroy the nation of Israel. He's attacking specifically the land promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And number four, to turn your hand against the people. He wants to kill the Israelis. He wants to kill all the Jewish people. And this is an attack against the nation aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. And the, the Jewish people here are described. They are a people gathered out of the nations that have gotten cattle and goods. Well, the cattle speaks of livestock. The goods speak of material wealth. In other words, Israel is prosperous. Israel is prospering economically. And they, dw they dwell in the middle of the world, or the center of the world, or the, or the navel of the world, as the Hebrew literally says. In other words, the point here is that Israel will be either the most influential nation on the face of the earth, or one of the most influential nations on the face of the earth. So that's a uh, that's quite a description of Israel during our time. During our time here, we may see Israel continue to grow to become the most influential nation on the face of the earth. Keep your eye on Israel. All right. The key purpose, though, for Gog's invasion is spoil, material gain, riches, prestige, and the like. Now, the text is silent about the content of the spoil. Cattle and goods, silver and gold are just general, general terms for the spoils of war. So there's been lots of speculation uh, around this point. Will it be natural gas? Will it be uh, oil? Etc., etc. Well, we'll just wait and see what happens. But one thing we do know, it's all in Gog's self-interest, whatever he's going after. And so... The Israel, the nation of Israel, will look to him like a ripe raspberry, ready for the picking. Ripe for the picking. And he's going to go after her. But he's not going to go after her without some protest. Now it's revealed that a group of nations protest the invasion in verse 13. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish, with all its villages, will say to you, Have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to capture great spoil? So the protesters are named. First of all, Sheba. Uh, Sheba is Yemen today, modern-day Yemen, on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. Then Daydan. Daydan is a tribe in Saudi Arabia, an um, Arab tribe. Next is mentioned the merchants of Tarshish. Now there are three possible locations for these Phoenician trading colonies, the merchants of Tarshish. Uh, one, Tarshish, was located on the west coast of Africa. It's not likely that that's the one that we're, we're referring to here. Another one was located in England, another Tarshish in England. That's possibly the one that they're referring to, but more likely, probably the one that's being referred to is the Tarshish in Spain, in Spain. Now, Tarshish is mentioned with all the young lions thereof. Now that's a Hebrew idiom for the nations which arose out of Tarshish. Now Africa, no nations arose out of Africa, so we can remove the African toward Tarshish. Now England, now here's the England's to the north there. Now England, out of England arose the United States, Canada, Australia, British Commonwealth of Nations. So it's possible that they could be speaking of, of England and uh, those nations that arose out of England as um, protesting. But more than likely, it's Spain. There's Spain. And the nations that arose out of Spain were Central and South America, with the exception of Brazil, with the exception of Brazil. So based on previous references, the most likely candidate is the Tarshish of Spain, with Central and South America protesting, with the possibility of England and the U.S., uh, the British Commonwealth and the U.S. protesting as well. So that's a possibility, but more than likely it's going to be Central and South America, the nations uh, of the Western Hemisphere, but nations spawned by 
Spain. All right, what is their protest? They shall say unto you, now they have Gogol figured out here, they'll say unto you, have you come to take the spoil? Are you after spoils of war, economic gain? Have you assembled your company to take the prey? Have you assembled to plunder through military victory and gain prestige? So you want to carry away silver and gold, financial riches? You want to carry away cattle and goods, material riches? You want to take great spoil? So they realize that the real aim is to gain national wealth and prominence. That's the reason uh, Gog attacks. Now, let's note some items here. First of all, first of all, Sheba and Dedan, representing Semitic nations, Arabs, will not favor the Russian invasion, nor will the South American nations uh, either, the ones that came out of Tarshish. And again, this could possibly include the nations that came out of the English, England Tarshish. But the protesters recognize that Russia invades for her own self-interest. No matter what that, uh, what their stated reason might be, we're going to free Palestine or whatever, no matter what their stated reason will be, their real reason is gain, self-interest. Now the nations that that protest here never go beyond the stage of protesting, of complaining. They are either unable or unwilling to do anything more than voice disapproval. That's all they do. So the invasion itself comes to view, into view in verses 14 through 16. We start with God's challenge in verse 14. Therefore prophesy, son of man, and say to Gog, thus says the Lord God, on on that day when my people Israel living securely, will you not know it? All right, so this introduces us to a new section. Prophesy, say to Gog. So Gog, we learn here that Gog has studied the Israeli situation very, very carefully. Israel is complacent and off guard. Aha, they note that. They note a relaxation and worrying about national security. So now Gog feels it's time, the time is right for the invasion. Now, you know, this is nothing new in Israel's history. This has happened before, right before the 1973 Yom Kippur War. And you can read about it in this uh, very interesting book by Howard M. Sachar, A History of Israel. This is volume two, 1807 to 1975. Now there you will read, there is peace on the banks of the canal and the Sinai Desert the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, Judea, Samaria, and on the Golan. The lines are safe. The bridges are open. Jerusalem is united. New settlements have been established, and our political position is stable. This is the result of a balanced, bold, and far-sighted policy, and you know that only the labor alignment could have accomplished this. Sakhar writes, in anticipation of elections, to the 8th Knesset, these bold-faced and self-congratulatory labor placards greeted citizens from kiosks and wallboards in every town and city of Israel. They expressed a quite genuine public mood of national security. Complacent and off guard, and guess what happened? Bang! Down came the Yom Kippur War on us, and Israel just about last, lost that war. We just about lost it. That was a close call. We won it by the grace of God alone. All right. Now, in verse 15, we learn about the departure of Gog from the north. You will come from your place out of the remote parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great assembly, and a mighty army. You'll come from the uttermost parts of the north. Where? We don't know. But uh, Russia goes to the uttermost parts of the north. This is not limited to Togarma, as it was implied in verse 6. But this includes the, ent the entire army, because the Confederacy is described. It's you, Gog, many peoples with you, that's the allies, that's the coalition described in terms Ezekiel can, un can comprehend, a mighty army. A mighty army is going to come down against Israel. The arrival in Israel is in the first part of verse 16, 
and you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. And notice, it's my people. Israel is God's people even in unbelief. This is the first worldwide regathering in unbelief. And they come as a cloud over the land. The massiveness of the invasion is pictured like this huge cloud, storm cloud, uh, settling over the land. Then in the next, next part of verse 16, it shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land so that the nations may know that when, that when I am sanctified through you before their eyes, O Gog. And so the time, the time that shall come to pass is the latter days, eschatological times, future to us. I will bring you against my land, two points. First of all, my land. Ultimately, the whole earth is God's land. And that's emphasizing the divine side of the coin. I, will, I, bring, I God, will bring uh, Gog down upon Israel. God will bring this invasion about. And God's purpose, we now le learn God's reason for doing this, that the nations may know me, that the Gentiles will realize who is God indeed, and the means when I'm sanctified in you, O Gog, before the rise. So God will be set apart but what, by what he will do to Gog and the massive military coalition. They will realize, the nations of the world, world will realize that only Israel's God is capable of doing what happened right before their eyes. So there's initial success and the invaders enter the land. And while Gog has his purpose to take spoil, God has his purpose to be sanctified among the Gentiles. And again, an example of how God's sovereignty and man's free will work together. God and Gog are both working together to bring this about. God to glorify himself, and Gog is allowed to make responsible decisions, and he will be punished for those decisions. And remember, it's like a train running on its two tracks, okay? We have the sovereignty of God, the free will of man, and God holds it all together, Colossians 1.17. Okay? God holds everything together. All right, now we come to the destruction of the invaders. And this is in verse 17 with a, a declaration and an, ex and an accusation. Verse 17. Thus says the Lord God, Are you the one whom I spoke in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them. So God asks, are you the one I've talked about? Now God is not asking for information here. The statement is rhetorical. You know, God refers to previous prophecies that he had his prophets utter. So he obviously knows what's going on. He's not asking for information. He knows the future. You know, this is a, this is a rhetorical device. Now, nothing in the writing prophets spoke of an invasion from Magog except Ezekiel. But God speaks in the plural here. God is speaking in the plural. What could be going on here? Well, perhaps there were prophecies by vocal prophets who didn't record, who didn't write down the prophecies. Vocal prophets like Elijah and Elisha and Enoch. You know, there's a lot of prophets in Israel that uh, have not written down what they have, what's been revealed to them. All right, now let's move on to verse 18 and 19. It will come about on that day when Gog comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will rise, will mount up in my anger and my zeal and my, bla in my zeal and in my blazing wrath. So it's going to come to pass in that day, the day of the invasion, and it's going to come against God's land. The invasion is going to come against God's land. It's going to be anti-Israel. It's attacking the land promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And it's against God's people. It's anti-Semitic. It's going to be attacking the people, the nation promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And God's wrath is aroused as his covenant with Abraham is being attacked. Now, the invasion against God's people and land will cause God to move for two reasons. Number one, his jealousy. Now, this is jealousy in a good sense. 
It's the right of protection, the right to exercise ownership. And Gog is trying to violate the wife of the Lord. And that's uh, the fact that Israel is the wife of the Lord comes out in Ezekiel 16, 8. Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and, and covered your nakedness. And I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine. That's a wedding uh, um, statement. You became my bride, declares the Lord God. So God's jealousy, because Gog is trying to violate his wife. And then it comes because of God's wrath, his fierce anger that will destroy the invader. This is the cursing aspect of the Abrahamic covenant. Here's the Abrahamic covenant, the initial statement. I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Satan is trying to attack the land and, and um, blessing aspects of, uh, excuse me, the land and nation aspects of the Abrahamic covenant. He's attacking them. He's trying to destroy them. That's cursing Israel. He will be cursed. And the means of the destructions uh, begins to be explained in verse 19. First of all, an earthquake. I declare that on that day there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. And the results of that earthquake, verse 20, the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all the men who are on the face of the earth will shake in my presence. The mountains also will be thrown down, the steep pathways will collapse, and every wall will fall to the ground. So the results of uh, this earthquake, first of all upon life, fish, birds, beasts, creeping things, all creatures living in the land of Israel are terrified. This is a local earthquake. It's upon the land of Israel. And this is it will be fulfilled quite literally because Israel lies on a major fault line. And that major fault line is the Afro-Arabian Afro fault line. You can see it running north and south on this map right here. And uh, here, this is the northern part of it, is where Israel is sitting right on top of that fault line. All right, let's go in for a close-up. Here you can see the fault line right here. It's running right up the Jordan Valley. The Jordan Valley and the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea are all part of that fault line. So the, the land is ripe for a huge earthquake. God also says the mountains shall be thrown down. There'll be seismic movements, and there have been seismic movements in Israel that we can see from years past. For example, you could visit Maktesh Katan. Maktesh Katan is located here in the Jordan Valley along that, that earthquake fault. Now here we're heading for Maktesh Katan. It's inside that rim of mountains, and we're gonna drive right through that pass there. So we get up to the pass, and look, you can see layers of rock and dirt that used to be laying flat. They used to be laying flat, and now they've been pushed up 90 degrees. Look at that, seismic movement has shoved up these layers 90 degrees. Here's another view. You can see the layers of various layers that, of dirt and whatever of coming down upon one another and then shoved up at 90 degrees. This is the other side of the pass of Maktesh Katan. So seismic movement is part of that area. Now God goes on to say the steep places will fall. <clears throat> There'll be landslides. Every wall shall fall to the ground. The word there is homa, and that doesn't refer to the walls of buildings, but to city walls. So the ancient wall around the old city will probably be one of the walls that collapses. Here's the, here's the eastern gate and the eastern wall. This is, this is um, I believe, Arabic, Arabic uh, construction here. And here we're looking to the south, and you can see the city wall uh, zigzagging along the southern boundary of Jerusalem. You can see how thin it is. It could fall over. And then this is the southern wall of the Temple Mount of the platform that Herod built to put the temple on, and you can see it's just been repaired for many, many years. That section of the wall was bulging outward. It could have gone down any minute. But fortunately, finally, after a lot of exhorting by the Israelis, the, I believe it is the Jordanian government, uh, fulfilled their responsibility to repair that part of the wall. 
So collapsing walls are not outside a literal occurrence either. Now, what will be the results against Gog's army? Well, we start in verse 21. I will call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. So there'll be civil war breaking out among the coalition partners on the Judean hills there. And of course, the sword is just an euphemism for warfare. And uh, the location, my mountains, the Judean hills, will be the place of Gog's destructions. And again, here is the, here is the uh, Judean mountains, the mountains of Israel, the central spine of the nation. Uh, and the means, every man's sword will be against his brother. The different nationalities will start fighting among themselves. And an example of that is 2 Corinthians 20:23. 20, there we read, For the sons of Ammon and Moab rose up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, that's the Edomites, destroying them completely. And when they had finished with the inhabitants of Seir, they helped to destroy each other. So here we have... First, two against one, Ammon and Moab against Edom, and then one against one, Ammon against Moab, and they managed to kill each other off. And we have a modern example we can look to. Uh, we feared that this would happen during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. 34 nations gathered together in Saudi Arabia to kick Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. And it was, uh, it was feared that some of these armies, these small armies, would start fighting among each other. They never did and the operation was a success. Okay, other means of destruction is in verse 22. With pestilence, with blood, I will enter into judgment with him, and I will rain on him and on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him a torrential rain, with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. So another means of judgment, along with the civil war, will be plagues, pestilence, disease, and blood, that just speaks of violence. And floods, there's going to be an overflowing shower, torrential rain. And um, the accompaniments of the raining are going to be hailstones. That's associated with raging weather. And then fire and brimstone. And that is perhaps volcanic activity. That would be very consistent with a big earthquake. Or it could be purely supernatural. We'll see what happens. Keep your eye on, uh, on this event and see how it works out. In verse 23, the divine purpose is repeated. I will magnify myself, sanctify myself, and make myself known in the sight of many nations, and they will, be, and they will know that I am the Lord. So we have three purposes. I will magnify myself. God will bring proper glory to himself. I will sanctify myself. He will set himself apart as unique and revered. And I will make myself known in the eyes of many nations, in the eyes of the Gentiles. They will finally know, they will finally understand who it is who chose Israel and who protects Israel. And of course, uh, that information is already very available. For example, Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will smite you by day, will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. The nations should know that already but they don't pay attention. They don't pay attention. So they'll finally know who chooses Israel and who protects Israel. They will know that I am the Lord. They will know that He is the creator of heaven and earth. So God will totally destroy the invaders by both natural and very possibly by supernatural means. Israel will not destroy these invaders. No other nation is used to destroy the invaders. Mankind does not do it. In this way, God will get the glory. You know, God will not use the USA to destroy the forces of the, Roman, of the uh, Russian coalition. If he did, who would get the glory? The USA would get the glory. And the glory rightfully belongs to God. Now this will also, this uh, destruction of Gog, will also short-circuit a typical Israeli attitude. 
the attitude, there is no God, we did it, we have the power. So many Israelis today are atheistic, prosperous, influential, confident, uh, just like we were before the Yom Kippur War. Anyway, Gog will see that, and he'll see it as a opportunity. All right, now we have to move into chapter 39, and we look at the overthrow of Gog. The addressee is in verse 1. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So this chapter is an example of the law of recurrence. Now you can read about the law of recurrence in Dr. Fuchsenbaum's book, The Law of Mas the uh, Footsteps of the Messiah. I would recommend you get this. Uh, it's the best book on eschatology and prophecy that I've ever read. Now, in the book, you'll read about the law of recurrence. This law describes the fact that in some passages of Scripture, there exists the recording of an event followed by a second recording of the same event, giving more details to the first. Hence, it often involves two blocks of Scripture. The first block presents a description of the event as it transpires in chronological sequence. This is followed by a second block of Scripture dealing with the same event and the same period of time, but giving further details as to what transpires in the course of the event. So, Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 23. That is an outline of the invasion and the subsequent destruction of the invading army. But now we get into chapter 39, verses 1 through 16. We cover the very same material, but now we get more details. Kind of like Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. Same idea going on there. So let's go and look at Ezekiel 39, 1 again. And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. So behold, I am against you, O Gog. This is again a repetition of the object of the prophecy. And then a description. He's the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Meshach, and Tubal. And Rosh is known as Russia today. And Meshach is Moscow. And Tubal is Tobolsk, uh, Russia, and two cities within Russia. All right, the invasion is, comes into view in verse 2. And I will turn you around and drive you on and take you up from the remotest parts of the north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. So I will turn you around from a planned attack elsewhere. You're going to go the other way. And I will lead you on. That's parallel to I will put hooks in your jaws. So the word means that God will convince Gog that he should attack Israel rather than his attended victim. God will make this inv invasion very, very, very inviting to Gog. He's tempting Gog. He's seducing Gog. Well, then the next phrase is kind of unfortunate. The King James didn't do the greatest job here. The King James reads, And I will turn thee back, and cleave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. Now, that's not the best rendering of the Hebrew this uh, rendering in the Old King James was corrected in the New King James. They rendered it, And I will turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel. So that's the better rendering. I will lead you on. Now, God says, I will cause you to come up from the uttermost parts of the north. And now, again, this is the source of the invasion. Uh, Israel is south here, and Russia is north, even the uttermost parts of the north from Israel, and he's going to go come down from the uttermost parts of the north into Israel. I'll bring you upon the mountains of Israel, so the invaders will enter the central mountain range. They'll come in, and they'll enter that mountain range, and that's where Jerusalem is located, the capital city. And that could very well be the object of their attack. So this will be the place of the destruction. And these mountains have been part of Israel only since the Six-Day War, 1967. And if a Palestinian state is created, which I really wonder if it ever will be, Israel will probably reconquer the West Bank 
And the reason I say I doubt it is because we are seeing a shrinking Jewish, a shrinking Palestinian state these days. Now this is 1947. In 1947, uh, Britain had given, by 1947, I should say, get, Britain had given everything to the west of the Jordan River to the, to the Jewish people. That was, it was named Palestine then. It was to be the homeland for the Jewish people. But they were resisted by the Arab, those Arabs that were living in the land, and so it became very, very difficult for Jewish people to claim their homeland, and we had to buy our own land back from, our, from the Arabs. And you, so you see, we made very little progress in occupying our own territory. Well, later on, in 1948, the, the um, UN finally concocted a plan to take Palestine, which was to be uh, the, the homeland for the Jews, and divide it in half, cut it up even more, and make it into two states, a Jewish state and a Palestinian state. Well, the, the Zionists, the Jewish people said, okay, it's better than nothing at all. The, rabbi, the rabbis, the Arabs said, nothing doing. And so they attacked Israel. Uh, well, by the time that attack and war was all over with in 1948, Israel had gained far more land than she had been designated in the UN, in the UN uh, plan. And the, uh, the Arabs had lost a lot of land. In fact, the Gaza Strip on the left, uh, is, is, uh, that little strip is, was occupied by Egypt, and then the, the uh, Judean hills in the middle of the country was occupied by Jordan. So that was the state of Israel till then. And uh, since then, Israel conquered the West Bank and has given overture, over overture, peace overture after peace overture to the Palestinians, and they have refused them all. And so Israel has gone ahead and slowly appropriated a little bit of land here and a little bit of land there. And so the uh, Palestinian state is shrinking. If the Palestinians had simply accepted the UN partition plan, they, way back in 1947, they would have had a flourishing uh, state and economy today. But instead, by refusing every opportunity to uh, compromise on the issue, we've seen nothing but a shrinking Palestinian state. So I really doubt if it will ever get established. All right, well, as the invasion comes, we see a failure of the weapons in verse three. I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. These are ancient terms for small arms, small arms weapons. And so small arms will be totally ineffective against disease, torrential rain, hail, fire, brimstone, which are God's weapons. The fall of the armies is described in verse four. You will fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you, and I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. So the fall of the army, they'll come in to the mountains of Israel right here. And uh, that, of course, is where Jerusalem is located. And that is where they will be destroyed. And the people who fall with you, Gog, are your hordes, the soldiers in the, the Russian army coalition and the allies, the other coalition forces, and the spoilers will become the spoil. Their corpses will become food for wildlife. Now the declaration that this is certain comes in verse five. You will fall in the open field, for it is I who have spoken, declares the Lord God. All right, so it, the mountains of Israel are where they will fall, and the guarantee is that this is spoken by God, who always follows through on his promises. And in verse six, we come to uh, new information, which is the destruction of the land of Magog, verse six. And I will send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. So while the armies are being destroyed in Israel, the country of origin itself is being destroyed, and this will be done supernaturally. It won't be done by atomic weapons. And, uh, <clears throat> and all of them that dwell securely in the isles, this is an expression 
uh, is a reference to the distant nations, the distant coalition partners. They will suffer destruction as well. And the result, they will know that I am the Lord. The invaders will finally recognize the God of Israel. God did this, not a human army. The nation and destruction has to be unique in order, to, in order for it to accomplish this goal in verse 6. And in verse 7, God's name will be sanctified among two groups of people. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let my holy name be profaned anymore, and the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. So God's name will be, God's character, God's person will be sanctified among two groups of people. First of all, among the Jewish people. My holy name I will make known in the midst of my people Israel. And this does not mean head knowledge, intellectual knowledge. This word means salvation knowledge, the personal knowledge of God. And so many will come to faith in Yeshua at this time, and the foundation is being laid. So now, the, the, um, those who trust in Yeshua, in Yeshua will become God's people both spiritually and positionally, the new believers. And God will not allow His holy name to be profaned anymore, which is a common problem in the past. And we've seen this in Ezekiel 20 and Ezekiel 36. And the second, the second group of people that will sanctify God's name are the Gentiles. This is not limited to Israel. The nation shall know that I am the Lord. They will learn who is God indeed. He's the Holy One of Israel. They will learn that the Lord is Israel's God. And this is certain in verse 8. Behold, it's coming, it shall be done, declares the Lord God. That's the day of which I have spoken. So the time for this prophecy will arrive. It will come sooner or later, and that is guaranteed. All right, I see I am a minute over. I've taken a little bit of your time, a minute, a minute and a half, maybe two minutes. So we'll just call it, um, we'll call it quits right now, and we'll pick it up next session as we look into some new information regarding this invasion by Gog and Magog. I'm not going to tell you what that new information is, but you'll find it to be fascinating and important. So we'll see you next session. Thanks so much for being our students. Lahitra'ot. Lahitra'ot.